Hello, and welcome to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary's Stay at Home Speaker Series. Today's program is Support Your Local Pollinator with Barbara Ritzheimer and Jen Hamp, two of Hawk Mountain Sanctuary's fabulous volunteers from our native habitat garden. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today, ladies. My name is Jamie Dawson. I'm the Director of Education at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, and we are so glad that you are joining us today. As you may know, Hawk Mountain is the world's very first refuge for birds of prey, and we continue to work hard to be leaders in raptor conservation, science, and education locally and globally around the world. Hawk Mountain is a private nonprofit, and membership is the lifeblood of our organization. To all of our members, a big thank you for all of your continued support. And if you're joining us today and you're not a member, we hope that you consider becoming one in the future. Hawk Mountain hopes that everyone remains safe and healthy during these times of COVID challenges. And we are thrilled to offer our local and global community a variety of free virtual programming. As always, Hawk Mountain greatly appreciates and depends on donations. Just so everyone is aware, today's program is being recorded. The video will then be accessible on Hawk Mountain's YouTube channel as a continued resource. We also have a link on our website directly connecting you to our YouTube channel. At any point during today's program, viewers may submit questions through the Q&A feature on the Zoom platform. We've designated time at the end of the program to take some questions from the audience. And we are so excited that Barbara and Jen are joining us today to teach us all about how we can support our local pollinators. Barbara is going to be our main presenter, so I'd like to take a moment to share some of Barbara's background experience with our audience. Barbara has a Bachelor of Science in Education and a Master of Science in History from Millersville State College. She served 35 years teaching secondary social studies in the Pine Grove Area School District. Barbara has been volunteering at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary since 2010 in a variety of capacities, including as keeper of the gate, helping out with parking in our native habitat garden, and as a mentor for the Hawk Mountain Sanctuary Young Birders. Barbara is also a Pennsylvania Master Naturalist since 2008 as well as an avid birder and a native plant gardener. So Barb and Jen, we are thrilled that you are both joining us. So let's start off by asking how both of you became so interested in native plants. Um, I've, I've been a birder for a while and I really got serious into birding when I retired from teaching. And I now had the time to volunteer at Hawk Mountain so I started out with the parking and the keeper of the gate. And then I saw there was a garden crew. And I thought, well, I like gardening. And I had, by this time, I had realized that birds needed plants to survive. So I thought, well, I'll join the garden crew. And those people got me interested in native plants. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So birds were your gateway into the gardening. Yep. Wonderful. What about you, Jen? Well, for me, it was a matter also of retiring, but in the case of my husband and I, we bought a property that needed a lot of work. Um, a lot of it was in the outdoors, you know, the, the environment around it, the, a lot of grass. And we decided after we read Doug Ptolemy's book about native plants that we would try natives. So I, started to learn as much as I could. And what I found was that working with other people that were also knowledgeable and passionate about nature was the best way to learn. And Hawk Mountain was the best way to teach me. And that's how we got involved into the native garden. I have learned so much that I've been able to transfer back to what we're doing and vice versa. So it's, it's a win-win. And I love being there. I love being in the, in the space. Wonderful. And thank you both so much for all that you do. And we have such a wonderful group of volunteers. And as an organization, what would we do without you? We're, we're forever in your debt. So thank you. 
And each of you may have touched on this a little bit, but if you want to elaborate a little bit more about what particularly inspired each of you to, to start volunteering at Hawk Mountain or to become involved with Hawk Mountain. Well, for me, it was the birding. Um, I had gone up to Hawk Mountain when I was younger, and I wasn't really seriously into birding at that point. But then um, once I started retiring and I had time and I could travel to different places and I really got into the birding, and I thought, well, there's Hawk Mountain. It's only like 20 miles away from my house. Why not volunteer there? So that's, that's how I ended up there. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Jen? My parents actually were members when they first moved into this area. And I, they have pictures of me on a backpack, you know, going up the mountain just as a toddler. Um, so it's kind of been in my blood, um, been busy with career and stuff like that. Um, but I think when you retire is the time that you really, I wanted to get back to my roots and um, of course, nature is such a, you know, an important part of, I think, of what we enjoy. So I, I found my way back. Wonderful. And there was just a nice little comment in the chat saying that Hawk Mountain is lucky to have both of you. Mm. Thank you both so much for sharing that. I loved hearing that background story. Um, all right, ladies, we are ready to learn more about local pollinators, pollinator activity. So I'm going to turn it over to you all. All righty. Okay. Um, here you see all the people usually when, when they say pollinators, they think of bees, but you have to understand that different plants are pollinated in different ways and there's all different kinds of pollinators. People normally don't think of bats as being a pollinator and for us where we live, they're not really that critical, but if you go into some of the more tropical areas, bats do a lot of pollinating. Uh, bees, beetles, Around the world, I believe beetles are some of the biggest pollinators. If you go into the more tropical parts of the world, uh, beetles do most of the pollinating. Birds, butterflies, everybody knows butterflies. We don't normally think of flies as being pollinators, but you know, besides the house flies, there's a lot of other flies and they do pollinate moths and some plants they require the wind to be a pollinator, which we're really not that concerned with. Um, how do you attract the pollinators? Well, native plants. Pollinators have adapted. They have grown for thousands of years in most cases, along with certain plants. A lot of pollinators specialize in certain plants. This particular bee likes this particular plant. Um, also try to get native plants that will bloom across an entire season. Um, you want some that bloom early in the spring for the first pollinators that come out until the late fall. It's important to have nesting habitat. If you've got ground nesting pollinators, try to have some clear areas in your yard. Um, where, where there's ground available. If you've got wood nesting pollinators, you want some dead wood near plants. Bumblebees, they tend to be in meadows. So if you have a grassy area that you can leave as a meadow, don't mow it. Um, or if you do have to mow it, only mow it maybe every three to five years. And provide a water supply. Um, a bird bath, a, a little container on the ground, something for them to use for a water supply. Um, here you have a, an example of some pollinator friendly things you can do. Now I understand not everybody has a big yard. My yard is very, very small. I can't do a lot of this stuff. But if you have a yard <clears throat> that's large enough 
then do some of these things. Leave some areas of bare soil. Now, if you're, if you're growing plants, you probably have bare soil. Don't cover everything with grass. If you can, some rocks or rock piles. Um, shallow sources of water. Leave some leaf litter in the fall. I don't collect the leaf litter. I let it there. I don't do anything with the leaf litter until the spring because the bugs and, and pollinators will crawl underneath there and they'll spend the winter there. Um, leave nectar plants in your lawn. Um, I have a lot of clover that's now growing in my grass. Bees love the clover. So I, I don't mow my lawn very, very short. I leave it a little bit longer. So there's always some clover flowers. So if there's nothing else growing that they can use, there's always some clover. Um, get rid of the invasive species as much as possible. And I know this, this goes against the grain of many people. Once the fall comes and the flowers die, leave some of those stems. Don't cut everything back. And I know my neighbors probably think this is really ugly. I'm, I'm sure they look at it and horrified, but I don't cut the stems down until I start to see the first pollinators in the spring. And the reason for that is some pollinators will crawl inside the stems, the dead stems, to spend the winter. So if possible, and again, I know some people can't do all of these things, um, and I know there's some rules and regulations that some towns have uh, against some of this stuff, but try to leave the stems if you can. Um, the things that are really bad, for pollinators is any kind of tilling, compacting, or scraping the sod, cutting down trees, removing branches, leaf litters. Again, I know not everybody can do this. Um, if you've got a, a tree that's not too healthy or that's dead and it's gonna hit your house, please cut it down. But if you can leave some stuff standing, great. Don't increase your lawn area. Don't cut back on the plant material in the fall. Now, <clears throat> hybrids or cultivars. Um, I know a lot of the plant places sell cultivars. They're prettier, the colors are nicer, the flowers are bigger. Try not to go in that direction. Um, a lot of them are clones, so you're not getting the, the biodiversity. It's, it's the same plant over and over and over. Um, they're not horrible for pollinators, and I believe unless they've been grown for red flowers, uh, reddish purple flowers, the pollinators will still go to them. Don't plant just annuals, make it be perennials, and try not to use insecticides, fungicides, or herbicides. Again, I understand that it's, it's tough to do some of this stuff. Um, my town has a, an ordinance that everything has to be no higher than eight inches. So I have to be careful with some of this stuff but I try as much as possible to follow this. And sometimes, um, and Jen can attest to that, she was just telling me, um, sometimes you have to go, you have to go with, with uh, some kind of herbicide. If you've got a lot of stilt grass in your yard, um, you can try pulling it out, but good luck. I think probably one of the, there's a couple things to remember about managing um, overgrowth. One thing I think is to, to always follow the directions of whatever herbicide you're going to use. Um, we use a product that is called Rodeo. It's actually um, 
a safer project product than Roundup because it doesn't have an extender. It is a poison and you have to follow the instructions for it. But it's important to, to do that sort of application on the right day at the right temperature when there's no wind. Um, and so be sure to follow instructions very carefully. And one other thing I wanted to say also about living in town and having to to deal with ordinances is a lot of times what you can do is mow maybe five or six feet away from the road backwards and then the rest of your your garden can be more full and more natural and native but by leaving that pathway or that extra berm I guess you could say um, that oftentimes satisfies neighbors and, and makes it look a little neater from, from the roadside view. Yeah, that's kind of what I've been doing. Mm -hmm. um, and then I put like bricks around the, the planting so it looks like yep. it's a more of a garden kind of thing. So you can get around it. Yep. Yeah, bricks is a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, in early spring you get what are called spring ephemerals. They don't bloom very long. They're very early. They're among the first flowers in the spring. For pollinators, they are extremely important. Um, bumblebees are usually some of the first bees that you'll see buzzing around and they really like the spring ephemerals. And there are even some species of pollinators, some bees that are only feeding on spring ephemerals. They'll, they'll only come out very early in the spring and, and that's what they feed on. And here's some examples of some spring ephemerals. Um, Jack in the pulpit, bloodroot, spring beauties, wild geraniums, azure bluets, rue anemone. Now I can't grow any of these in my yard. Um, most of these like a little bit more shady areas and my yard gets sun all day long so these would not survive but if you have a place um, in your yard where you could grow these these were real these would be really good things right the geraniums i think are a little bit more hardy for sun at least some types of geraniums are um Bloodroot tube will handle a pretty a fair amount of sun. Um, it's good to check out different kinds and um, it is really important to get those early spring flowers in. That's when the dandelions grow in my yard. Yeah, okay. that's another kind. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And uh, one of the books that I like to read and it's made me feel good is just how many what we consider almost nuisance plant nuisance plants are actually great food sources for for birds and insects and the dandelion is one of them for sure yeah dandelion is actually not a native but i don't i let it grow it That's you only really see it early in the spring it doesn't bother me that it's in my lawn um by the time you get later into the spring, the May, you don't even notice they're there anymore. And they are a pretty decent food source early in the spring. All right, bees. Um, two thirds of farm crops need pollination by bees. About half of Pennsylvania fruit and vegetable crops um, are pollinated by bees. Um, most of the Farms in Pennsylvania are not huge farms, so a lot of them rely on native bees. Um, and actually native bees are better pollinators than honeybees, and honeybees are not native bees. They were brought in by the settlers who wanted their honey. Um, a mason bee, which is a very tiny little bee, one mason bee can do the job of 200 to 300 honeybees. Now, if you're in California and you're growing almond trees, you need honeybees, all right? Mason bees are not gonna do it for you. So there's certain crops that absolutely require honeybees, but most of the stuff that's grown here in Pennsylvania 
you probably don't need honeybees. Now everybody's heard of the monarch butterfly, so I gave it a separate section here. <clears throat> if you're not familiar with the, the life cycle of a monarch, and this is true of all butterflies, egg to caterpillar to pupa to butterfly. Now the monarch is kind of unusual. The, the caterpillar, not the butterfly, not the adult butterfly, but the caterpillar can only grow on milkweed. They only eat milkweed. That's why everybody's now saying you got to grow milkweed, milkweed, milkweed. Um, and here the, the, com, the most common in this area are the common milkweed, butterfly milkweed, and the swamp milkweed. Those are the ones you're more likely to see in this area. There are a whole bunch of different milkweeds in different parts of the country. The monarchs get a toxin out of the milkweed, which when they then become an adult butterfly, <clears throat> because of the coloring, the orange and the black alerts, predators like birds, don't eat me, I'm poisonous. That's why over thousands and thousands of years, monarchs have adapted to that poison. They can take that poison in and not die from it. But if you've got a bird that goes and kills a lot of monarchs and eats a lot of monarchs, they're going to get sick or maybe even die from it. So monarch caterpillars absolutely must have milkweed. Before I go on here, the, the adult butterfly, they need native plants. You don't have to have milkweeds for the adults. Once the caterpillars hatch and become adults, they will go to other flowers. Um, hummingbirds, everybody likes hummingbirds and you'll probably start to see them now because the males are getting ready to migrate back south. Uh, the females and the young will take a little bit longer but if you've got um, hummingbird feeders out, you'll start to see a lot of hummingbirds coming to your feeders because they're, they're fattening up. Um, some of the, the flowers that are really good for hummingbirds, cardinal flower, jewelweed, columbine, penstemon, minarda, and you, you see the white flower there is penstemon, the pink is the minarda, and this is the cardinal flower. Um, during the breeding season, when they have young, a lot of people don't know this, hummingbirds feed their young mostly insects. The, the young birds need that protein to become adults. Once they're adults, they're going to start and, and fatten up to fly south. Then, they're gonna, then they start to go to the flowers. I think it's also if, to look at the plants. Could we go back there? Yeah, I just wanted to mention, I think it's so fascinating to see what he, with, the, with, the, with the hummingbird, you can really see the connection between the flowers that the hummingbird prefers and the hummingbird itself. If you look at the long beak of the hummingbird and you look at the long, long tubule of that, um, the, uh, <laughs> cardinal flower. Oh, thank, thank you. The cardinal flower. Um, you can see how just well suited. It's almost as if you can see how nature kind of evolved together to create a win-win situation for both the plant and the bird. That's why it's so important to to plant those native plants. The the birds, bees, whatever, they have developed alongside these plants. So they've got adaptations that allow them to work with these plants. And if you throw in a plant that they, they have never seen before, they're not gonna go there. They're gonna say, I don't, I don't know, can I eat this? Is this useful to me? They haven't seen it, so they're not going to go there. Now, here's something that I just learned not too long ago. Moths are really important pollinators. 
Um, they like mostly the nocturnal plants with white or pale flowers and that have a strong uh, smell to them. They're, they're more what are called generalists. The monarch is not a generalist. The monarch needs milkweed. Moths tend to go to whatever plants are available. So they're not tied as much to a specific species of plants as some other pollinators. And be aware, moths, there are moths that are active in daytime. If you've ever seen those hummingbird moths, a lot of people think they are actually hummingbirds. Their wings go very, very fast. You'll see them in the daytime, but they are actually moths. Um, here's just some examples, and, and we've mentioned a few of these before. Any kind of milkweed is, is a good pollinator plant. Joe pie, uh, which is this one in here. Uh, mountain mint, I found mountain mint is fantastic. Bergamot or bee balm, hyssop, obedient plant, New England aster, any of the golden rods. Um, you know, you can go to native plant sales, and if you're not that familiar with the plants, there will be people there who can tell you um, what plant is good for your environment, your particular environment. You know, if I go, and I learned this up at Hawk Mountain from all the, the garden crew, I have a very, very sunny yard. It gets almost no shade. So I would say, well, what plant can I put there? Because if you put the wrong plant in the wrong environment, it's not going to survive or it's not going to do really well. So, and by the way, Hawk Mountain, I'll put this plug in, Hawk Mountain is planning on having a fall native plant sale, assuming COVID-19 doesn't get any worse. Uh, that's still being planned in September. So if any of you are interested, that's a good place to learn about native plants. Um, these are all pollinators that I had never ever seen before in my yard last summer. And if you look at these pictures, um, these are all on the mountain mint. These are all mountain mint. I have a clustered mountain mint and that seems to be one of the plants that attracts the most different kinds of pollinators. I don't know what it is about that plant, but they really, really, really like it. They do. Now, I just threw this in. Um, when most people think of native plants, they're always thinking of like the cho pie and, and so on. But don't forget about trees and shrubs. Early in the spring, a lot of trees and shrubs are blooming before the flowers are really starting. And I've got a couple pictures here that I took this spring. Um, this is spice bush and alder. And if you look at behind these, there's nothing else. There's no leaves. There's nothing else blooming at that time. So if, if you're one of these pollinators that emerges very early in the spring, you're going to be looking for these. Um, if you can, and again, I realize not everybody can do this, but if you can, plant some oaks. I know they take a long time to grow, but they are fantastic for pollinators. They host somewhere around 530 some moth and butterfly caterpillars. Different oaks attract different caterpillars. Um, they are fantastic areas for bird food. With very few exceptions, birds feed their young meat, protein. I think maybe the only true vegetarian bird is the goldfinch. Um, like I told you before, hummingbirds, even hummingbirds feed their young insects. So birds need caterpillars. They don't, birds don't want to feed beetles to their babies. They don't want to really feed butterflies or moths to their babies. Who wants to give their, their little baby bird this hard, horrible beetle with this hard shell? They want soft, squishy food. 
So they're going to look for caterpillars. And, and again, this is something I just learned recently. Chickadees need anywhere from 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to raise one clutch of birds, of baby birds. That's a lot of caterpillars. Um, and for bluebirds, they've discovered that caterpillars make up about 41% of the food for bluebirds. Now, how do we benefit from that? When you're putting native plants in, you're reducing pollution, you're improving health, you reduce mowing. I, I've turned about half of my yard into native plants, so my mowing time is cut down significantly. Native plants, you can pretty much let them alone. Um, I don't do anything once they start to grow. When I first put them in the ground, yeah, I water them pretty much every day or every other day until they become established. But after that, I pretty much leave them alone. They take care of themselves. Um, if you've got a problem with flooding, uh, native plants can be really good in a rain garden or for flood control. You don't need chemicals. I do not fertilize my plants. Um, I try not to use any kind of insect spray or anything like that. Um, I just had a problem with my smooth blue aster and I contacted Jen and I said, do I need fungicide for this? And she said, well, no, let's try something else. And I just chopped them all down and they're growing back nicely. I, I think they're going to be fine come fall. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not like you have to go out there with some other flowers and you have to tend them and you have to take the old flowers off. So I just leave them alone. They're on their own. Once they get established, they're pretty much on their own. And they I, do sequester carbon. I think it's a testament to the resiliency of a native plant and it's in the right place that the root stock, the root that was there, Barb, after you decided to cut it down, it's, it's there, it's healthy. It says, okay, I'm just gonna grow back up again. And that's something that might not happen if a plant is not happy where it is located. So I think it's another reason why um, it's actually less expensive. Once you get natives established, you're not gonna be repurchasing plants every year, like you said. Yeah, and they spread. I, I now, I had one plant of brown-eyed Susans. I now have millions of brown-eyed Susans all over the place. They have, they migrate. These plants kind of find a place of their own. I, I would get like one plant of each thing that I wanted and that's it. They have spread. That, that's another thing you've got to understand about um, these native plants. They do, if they, if they find a nice spot, they will spread. You can collect seeds. So if you wanna move a plant to another place in your yard, you can collect the seeds after they're finished growing and you can just throw the seeds in where you want them or you can separate the plants. Um, I, had, I had one obedient plant. I now have a million obedient plants. Um, so, you know, it's, you don't have to put a lot of money into it. Um, once you've got one plant that becomes established, you can separate them, you can move them to different parts in your yard, and you, you can give them to your friends. I'm to the point now where some of them I think I have to give away because they're just everywhere. Um, the brown-eyed Susans are spreading like crazy. The smooth blue aster I planted in the front of the house. I now have it at the side of the house. I have no idea how it got there. Probably birds. Um, so, you know, it's just so much easier to take care of these plants because they pretty much take care of themselves. The only time I water them a little bit is if we, if we have maybe a little bit of a drought. I almost went out and, and started watering them earlier this week, but then I heard about the tropical storm that's coming up the coast and I figured, ah, they'll get water. And they're fine, they're happy. The other 
the other thing that that is really becoming important and i don't know if any of you have heard the news but there seems to be a, a tremendous decline in insects um and that just is not an option you know me as a birder i know the birds need insects so when i hear that millions of insects are are being eliminated i i have a real problem and i notice i don't know if anybody else does but i notice even like five six years ago if if i were out driving in the summertime my windshield would be splattered with dead bugs i hardly get any bugs on my windshield anymore next time you go out driving take a look um, it's it's becoming noticeable um, and insects like birds and other animals they just can't adapt quickly enough to non-native plants um, if i'm a, a bug and i have always pollinated um, bee balm and now i have no bee balm i'm not going to go looking for another plant to replace the bee balm i i did not develop alongside that that bee balm I don't know any other plants. I need that bee balm. You start losing these pollinators, you're going to lose most of your flowering plants. And that includes agricultural crops. People forget that. If you like bananas, if you like chocolate, it, it's not just in our country that is becoming a problem. It's, it's around the world. So if you like bananas and you like eating chocolate, we got to save those pollinators. Or so, if you like tomatoes, or if you like yep. tomatoes, flowers everywhere. <laughs> yep. That's part of the cycle. Absolutely. So you lose the insects, there's no food for the birds, other animals. There wouldn't be any insects to help decay things. We forget about that. You know, we forget that trees die and they lie on the forest floor there's bugs that take care of those dead trees and eventually they'll get rid of that dead tree for us. Um, you know, there's like vultures. People forget how good vultures are at getting rid of dead stuff that otherwise would just be rotting there um, and we wouldn't know what to do with it. And eventually you don't have the insects. We don't have food. We're gonna die too. Um, now, if you're wondering, well, how do I know what plants are right for me? Um, if you go to Audubon, the Audubon website or the National Wildlife Federation, um, they actually, you can put in your address where you live and they will actually give you a list of plants that are good for your area. So. You know, you don't have to start and say, oh, I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, I'm going to try this plant. I'm going to try that plant. There are actually places where you can go and you put your address in and they will find the plants that are right for your area. And like I said, um, if you know some place that, that is having a native plant sale, um, you can go there and people are very knowledgeable and they will be more than happy to explain to you what plants would work best uh, for your yard. And you can get very specific if you go to a, a native plant sale. Um, you know, I have a, a back part of my yard that is very shady and moist. What do I put in there? Or I have a part of my yard that's sunny. Uh, it never gets shade. It's kind of dry, the soil isn't very good, what can I put in there? <clears throat> you'll, you'll be able to find people that can tell you this is a good plant, that's a good plant. Don't put this one in where it's wet, don't put this one in where it's dry. And the other, the, the book that I would suggest reading is Nature's Best Hope by T Doug Tallamy. Any of Doug Tallamy's books are great. His, his newest one is Nature's Best Hope. And he's trying to convince people, and I think this is a really good idea, 
to take just a little bit of your yard. You don't have to get rid of your lawn. You don't have to get into a fight with your town about having plants that are too tall. But if you just, if every one of us would just take a little part of our yard and plant it native plants, it would make all the difference in the world. And if you don't have a yard, you know, some people live in an apartment. Maybe you have a balcony. Maybe you have a little patio. These plants will grow in pots, in planters. You don't have to have a big yard. Believe me, I have a very small yard and I've got tons of plants growing in there. So I would suggest um, if you're interested, Doug Tallamy's Nature's Best Hope. And if you wanna see what these websites look like, this is the Audubon. Um, and you just put in your email address, your zip code and do the search and they will tell you what plants are best for your area. And if this, this um, native plant finder um, is something new, there, it's still in the beta, it's not the final format, but you can see there, find native plants, find butterflies, and then your list of plants for yourself. So all you have to do there, you don't have to register for these websites. You don't, you know, it's not a big deal. You just put in your address and they will uh, format a list for you. Here's what is really good for your area. Okay. I was gonna say, I was thinking too about the situation where many of us are, where we don't have any yard um, maybe you're a student in college. Um, maybe you live on the third floor apartment with no balcony. Um, there are other ways that you can get involved in nature. One of them, of course, is to come to Hawk Mountain and actually participate and enjoy and support an organization such as this. Um, there are also many communities that have native gardens right in the town or, you know, in a city park. Um, you can you can organize something if there isn't anything there, um, and the other thing is to um, find unique places where plants can grow, such as um, in your church. Maybe has a yard. Um, maybe there's there's a little place at your favorite restaurant. You can encourage some native plants there. So I think we can all get involved. We don't have to actually own the land, but we, we, all, we all are part of it. So I think it's good to be creative about what you can do. Yeah, where I live, um, I don't know what the group is, but they've, they've started a butterfly garden in, mm -hmm. in this little local park. Um, we also had a lot of flooding a few years ago. So some homes okay. were leveled and you can't build anything on those sites anymore. Um, I know there are some people that are talking about turning them into little, little corner parks, you know, just a little corner on the street um, where you could plant native plants. Oh, absolutely. Well, thank you both so much. That was fantastic. And if people after watching this presentation aren't excited about getting native plants and planting native plants. I don't, I don't know what much more you can say to inspire people. Um, it's, it's just such wonderful information you shared. Thank you so much. So um, was there anything else that you wanted to share uh, there, at the moment, Barbara Jen? There was one question that came in. I was curious to see if, if there were some questions. Yeah. And this, one, this one's a real challenge, Barb. Uh -oh. It said, <laughs> I know, <laughs> it says, <laughs> How many different species of pollinators are there? Oh, so I, I, no I did a little, a little search <laughs> and I'm, I'm just curious to know what you think. <laughs> but I, what, what it said in, in Google was that there are over 200,000 different species. Now that, like you were explaining, that includes bats and it includes moths, it includes the whole gamut, but... <laughs> Yeah, and you know, if you go into tropical parts of the world, um, 
you're going to find different pollinators. I, I believe in the tropical parts of the world, beetles are the biggest pollinators. Mm -hmm. Whereas in our part of the world, it's, it's mostly bees. Um, so, you know, but yeah, that, that sounds about right. I, I know there are like many, 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 many pollinators and there, a lot of them are in trouble. Um, yeah. You know, you go into the more tropical parts of the world, the, the Amazon is being burned down. So it's not just a problem um, in our area, it's a problem worldwide. A lot of pesticide use. Um, yeah, it's, it's a easy, problem. It's easy to get discouraged too. And I think it's important that we try to surround ourselves with what we can do. Um, yeah, it worries me very much about the loss of insects and um, loss of butterflies loss of habitat. So that's why I think if we can just take a little spot and just work with it, um, even if it's even if it's at the schoolyard or, or at the churchyard. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, if you just look at, at monarchs, what's happened to monarch butterflies, I know they're the insect of the moment, but um, what's happening to monarchs is happening to, to many other insects. Um, and a lot of it is our own fault. Um, you know, farmers are using uh, Roundup a lot. Well, the crops they're putting in have been adapted, so they, they're not affected by Roundup. But everything else that the, what we can, weeds, you know, like milkweed, which used to grow, when I was a kid, we, we had milkweed everywhere. Around every farm field, there would be milkweed growing. Well, you don't see that anymore because they've, they've put down Roundup. Or a lot of farmers now um, will mow to the very edge, uh, will plant to the very edge of the field. They don't leave a strip anymore of, of grass where weeds can grow. Towns, townships, uh, the state, they all mow by the side of the roads anymore. You know, you, you drive down 81 or 78 or whatever, they're always mowing. Uh, the townships around me, they're always mowing by the, side of the, uh, by the sides of the road. Well, those are the kind of places where milkweed likes to grow. So, you know, it's, it's our fault to a yeah. large extent. It's not all our fault, but to a large extent. Climate change is, is becoming an issue. Um, and and so, I would... Yeah. Sorry, I wanted to add that, and I think you both mentioned this, that um, it can be, as you're saying, discouraging, like seeing all these declines, but the good news is that the power of the individual ch uh, choice that people have with whatever space they have available, that they can choose to plant native plants. And collectively, if everyone just made that choice to plant some native plants in whatever space they have collectively, that could be such a huge impact. And that's hopeful. Um, we did have some questions come in, ladies. Uh, two questions came in about deer. Any suggestions for native plants that deer do not eat or, if, you know, people that live in an area where deer can be uh, competitors uh, for, <laughs> for plants? Uh, what, what are some native species that you would recommend that are maybe deer, uh, the deer would leave alone? That one's for you, Jen. Every time I think about a, a deer-resistant plant and I plant it, and then sometimes I find out, oh, <laughs> maybe not to my deer, <laughs> but <laughs> I have found that planting in clusters, I've been observing how plants naturally grow. As we've been trying to start to reforest certain areas that, was one, that were once field. So you go through these phases of kind of clustering of plants, um, everything from large asters to um, some vines to grasses to sedges and you see how things cluster and what's fascinating is that plants seem to understand how to just sort of gather around and protect the space and I'll find an oak tree growing right and smack in the middle of that had that not been clustered a deer would have found it or a hickory so I think, you know, just being creative about how you, even just um, creating some piles of things around that um, uh, the deer are going to go away. They're going to, they're just not going to bother. They're not really, 
they're not really too smart. They're going to take the easy way around your property. So if you kind of create a, a little bit of a barrier, it could be with the stones. Um, but there are some very good deer resistant plants. And frankly, the ones that we sell at the Hawk Mountain for the most part are. And if there is something that's particularly delicious to a deer, um, our folks will tell you about that. Um, and again, I do think, unfortunately, it depends a lot about how much pressure there is in an area. Um, deer will eat a lot of things that they normally wouldn't eat if, if there's too much um, competition. Um, thank you both. So we have another question coming in, looking for some advice. Um, well, I'll just read what they wrote. I live in a condominium. The association does lawn applications with chemicals and puts down mulch with weed killer in it. Mm -hmm. I want to attend a board meeting and express my concern. How can I present my concerns without them becoming defensive or targeting me for association violations afterwards? That's a tough one. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, <laughs> I think that part of the solution is right in the question is to not, you know, to not try to be defensive, not try to be um, accusatory because those practices have been going on so long and people honestly think that that is correct. So it is a kind of educational process and maybe it's easy to, maybe it would be possible to start simple with something like a little corner garden that maybe you could use the idea that we will create um, a way to prevent runoff by doing this one little corner garden. For example, plant some Joe pie weed in that corner, um, some um, goldenrod, something like that. And people can then begin to explore it, get involved in it, get interested in it. And um, at least I know with, with some of the projects I've done in townships, it seems as if if you take an oval area or rectangular area that's sort of off the beaten path in, in a park, you can get away with planting a, a kind of cacophony of native stuff and people see it as attractive from a distance and um, plant some benches around it. There are, there are ways to, I think, to make it attractive. Um, but you're right. I mean, I, I think the, the listener was absolutely right on that, that um, we need to be um, not defensive or try to preach, but to try to educate. Yeah, yeah that, that's the key. Everything I've read is go to a meeting and try to educate. Mm -hmm. You know, do you realize that by putting this on your lawn, you're doing such and mm -hmm. such, you know, that kind of thing. And it, it may take you years mm -hmm. to convince people. Yeah. Maybe she should ask to present the recording link of this presentation. At the <laughs> there, you <go. laughs> there you go. Yeah, <laughs> give permission. You may. may do. Uh, but that's a great question. And and um, yeah, so good luck with that. And um, yeah, it, education is is so key for conservation in all aspects. Um, and are there any more questions? I think we got them all. I definitely some comments coming in praising both Barb and Jen, saying awesome job, you ladies rock. Um, so I guess that's it where there's no more questions. So Jen and Barbara, thank you both so much for sharing um, obviously your passion and your, your expertise and knowledge um, on such a critical and important issue. So thank you so much. A huge thank you to all of our viewers joining us today. Um, it means so much to us uh, to be able to share time with you and interact even if it's via Zoom. We really appreciate it. And um, as Barb mentioned earlier, you know, Hawk Mountain, we have two, typically when it's not a global pandemic, <laughs> we have two native plant sales a year, one in the spring and fall, and um, it's, it's mid-May and mid-September, correct? Yes. Um, so fantastic way to get native plants and support the sanctuary. And again, kudos to all of our volunteers that work so hard to make that, those plant sales happen. Um, so come and visit us at Hawk Mountain. Our trails are open. We have modifications for... Uh, social distancing. Uh, check out our website. We're doing all trail fees, uh, trying to do them online or with exact change. And of course, members never have to pay trail fees. 
And as always, we have many virtual programs coming your way soon. And here's a preview for what's in store um, over the next week or so. Uh, next Wednesday, July 15th, we have Pennsylvania Black Bears with Dan Lynch of the Game Commission. That's at one o'clock. On Friday, July 17th, we have the Bats of Hawk Mountain with Aaron Haynes at four o'clock p.m. Uh, on Wednesday, July 22nd, we have uh, the Forests of Hawk Mountain with regional forester from DCNR, Steve Ziegler at one o'clock p.m. On Thursday, July 23rd, Sanctuary Storytime. Friendship at the Feeding Station at 11. And also on Thursday, July 23rd, the wind and the water migrating along the East Asian Oceanic Flyway with um, former trainee Camille Concepcion. And that's at 4 o'clock p.m. Have a fantastic weekend, everyone. And uh, thanks for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Bye for now. Thank you, Erin. Bye. 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 Happy planting. Happy planting. <laughs> Happy planting. Good night. Mm -hmm.